Everyone's running. Where are, we, where are we running to? I gotta do more. I've gotta earn more. I've gotta make sure people like me. I've gotta people please. I've gotta get be all things to all people. I got it under control. Don't worry, I got this. What lies beneath all of that is your ability to heal your own wound of not feeling enough. If we don't knock that out in the beginning, everything else feels like pushing a boulder up a hill. Welcome to We Do Hard Things, the show about facing fears, taking big risks, and chasing down dreams. On today's show, I sit down with the author of Worthy Human, Tracy Litt, to talk about fighting the feeling of not being good enough, why you ultimately are the one holding yourself back, and why you're also the one who's going to save yourself. Today's guest went from one moment in her life feeling like she had everything figured out. She had the relationship of her life. She was pregnant with her first child. They were building a dream home. To the next moment, watching her husband leave her, baby crying in the crib, wondering how she had fallen into what felt like someone else's life. And so today's conversation, we are going to dig into her personal story. We're gonna talk about why she left a cushy, multi-six-figure job to strike out on her own. And of course, of course, we're gonna share the secrets to feeling good enough. We're gonna share the secrets to fighting that feeling of not being good enough. But taking a step back, I actually had the privilege of meeting today's guest, Tracy Litt, at a conference last October that we were both at. I was hosting the, the event to the conference. She was a speaker at the conference. And so to kick off our conversation on the podcast today, there was actually something that I wanted to ask her. Because when I met her in person, there was one thing after, you know, we spent a few days together, but there was this one thing that made me go, huh. And that was why her walk-on music, that's the music that we play at conferences when the speakers walk out onto stage. Why did, was her walk-on music Guns and Roses? I am obsessed with the song Sweet Child of Mine. It is the ring on my phone. Like is it? everybody who calls me, yes. So every single time my phone rings, my hands go up like I'm at a rock concert for just a brief second. And I triple dog dare you to not listen to the opener of that song and feel like lit up and ignited. You're like, dang, dang, dang. And it was also the processional music at my wedding. So when they announced my husband, my husband and I, you know, husband and wife. That came on and it was like, okay, the party can start now. Okay, so hold on. Is this is just is this a, a sign of the time and your age, or does this song ha- have deep meaning for you? It there's really no deep meaning. It is a total <laughs> like I wish I could tell you some amazing it's story just like about a how this college song or a high school thing kind of thing. Yeah, no, it is a well, I'm a rock girl at heart. I was the lead singer of a rock and roll cover band for many, many years. <gasps> really? Fact. Yes. Wow. So everything in my world happens through the lens of lyrics and music. Like oftentimes for the middle of a group coaching call, someone will say something and I will just break out in the song that corresponds because I don't want to help myself. I like, I have to let it out. Um, so music is such a big part of me and sweet child of mine just has that opening riff that is like, no matter what is going on, you're like, Oh, and you are standing and you are ready to rock it out. Oh my goodness. I love that so much. So many different ways we can. Okay. So what was the name of the cover group? Trixie and the Nortons after the honeymooners. (laughs) Okay. Uh, I I, I don't know any of those references, but okay. (laughs) I mean, the honeymooners couldn't share a bed or something. I remember that on television. Yeah. The honeymooners was a really, really old school 1950s uh, show. And um, Norton was the neighbor and Trixie was the wife. So it was me and five awesome dudes so we just decided I'm Trixie and they're the Nortons and we covered Led Zeppelin and Stevie Nicks and Sarah McLaughlin and the Pretenders <laughs> and that whole range, the Beatles, everything. So now I know, cause, cause you and I were lucky enough to actually meet in person at a live event last October. Um, and you walked out, uh, to, to Sweet Child of Mine and the music kind of faded earlier. And as a joke, I was like, sing the song. And, and then you did. And then I was like, holy smokes, you're like really good. And I thought it was like just this thing that you did. But now I realized 
that's your bag. <laughs> it's my bag. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of the reasons why I also love speaking and feel so comfortable because I fronted a band. So when you front a band, right, it has like a similar vibe to when I get to transformationally speak on a stage. It's like, hey, people, let's do this. Well, that actually brings us very nicely to what we're going to speak about today because um, I was lucky enough to get this copy of your book, Worthy Human, which is amazing, 2019 book. So just came out right before the pandemic. I imagine you would have tweaked a few things uh, knowing what you know now, but, <laughs> oh, yeah. but going back in your story a little bit, um, you know, you weren't always, I mean, you may have been on stage as, as a lead singer, but you were not a speaker. You were not a transformational coach. You were, um, gosh, I was going to say this badass chick who's in front of me, but you, you've always been pretty badass. But, but I mean, you have kind of the safer path. So what took the woman from being in the cover band on stage with five dudes rocking out to corporate VP of whatever in a job that you didn't really like? Yeah. Ah, such a good question. Um, so the person, I, I believe I have been about seven different versions of myself. <laughs> Truly, right? Like I know sometimes they say it feels like lifetimes ago, but I really feel like I have lived seven legit lifetimes. And in each one, it has awoke me to something bigger and to opportunity of where I wasn't showing up for myself because you're spot on. I was, I was not this level of clear and badass and unabashedly take me or leave me either way. Awesome. My whole life. That's something that I worked on as I did my own healing and growth. Um, but you know, my biggest awakening happened when I was in what I see as my biggest failure, which is, finding myself a single mother with an eight month old baby crying on my garage floor. Okay. So, so this is a moment in your life where, um, a few years earlier, your, your mom had passed. Yes. Uh, you are, you are in, uh, you know, you're in this relationship, which is the one, mm -hmm. right? You've just yeah. built a dream home. You have, you have your first child and yeah, I mean, okay. So walk us through what leads us to the point where you're now sitting on your garage floor weeping and, and at this low point. Yeah. And I think I love how you're just threw it out there that way because it eight month old. So we had just finished the house. Like we just moved in the house. I just had this gorgeous baby girl who's now 17 and a half, you know, just giving time frame. Um, and what culminated was all of the red flags I ignored for all of those years. I started seeing all of the things I tolerated, everything that I ignored. And it came together after my daughter's father looked at me and said, I don't love you anymore. And what was interesting about that was that I was having conversations privately with my girlfriends going, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know that this is right. There's something going on. And I just don't have the confidence, you know, and it's because I had a lot of worth work to do. Like that's where uh, my whole journey of what I teach is always things I worked on on myself, always things I experienced myself. And what ultimately happened was that relationship came crashing down because I didn't honor myself because I didn't, because I settled because I was allowing behavior and I was allowing, um, behavior towards me that I wouldn't tolerate ever now and that I would be outraged if any of my daughters tolerated. So that came together and it was one like really intense night where we had split up, he moved out, my daughter's crying in her crib. I'm in one of those parental positions. Like I can't hear her cry. I was the kind of like, I would turn the monitor off, like just, you know, trying to get her to sleep. And I went into the garage because I needed to let it out. And that's when I just laid on the garage, like snot bubble, fetal position, hysteria, heaving, which I think is really important to acknowledge because we need that. Like we are primal and we sit so often and just like hold it in or suppress or just cry a little, but we got to go there. So I wanted to go there in a place where she could, couldn't disturb her. So I went into the garage and in going there and getting to the point where I had expressed my emotions so thoroughly that I had nothing left inside. I was in such a place of silence that I was able to hear my higher self. I was able to receive this like, okay, what are you going to do? 
You're either going to retreat back into the victim you've been, or this is a moment. This is a crossroads moment. And you are going to completely drastically change who you've been and the choices you've made for the sake of that little girl inside there. And that's what I did. And that's how I landed in the VP of HR job. Because then I said to myself, okay, so what do I do to support and create this gorgeous life that I, that I desire? Um, and what can I use my skills for? Because I had owned an event planning business prior to having her. And as a single mother, I wasn't going to be able to work nights and weekends. Event planning is all nights, all weekends. I would have missed her whole life. So I said, okay, I can, I'm great at, I've got great people skills, great organization. I'm super personable recruiting. So hold on before, <laughs> before we get into kind of the answer though. Yes. I want to, I want to sit in this moment for a bit. So the day before this happened, you know, you're talking with your girlfriends leading up to it. You're not sure you can do it, but in your mind, you're ignoring these red flags, but in your mind, what version of your life are you living? Like, like, what are you guys working towards and what do you guys want oh, I'm the day the before this? Oh, I'm living the version of my life. Yeah, I'm, I'm living the version of my life that everybody told me I should want. Ah, I have which a house. was like I, I have house, house, kid. Baby, all my friends are getting married. Let's do that. Um, and let's find someone to be with because, you know, especially as little girls, there's a lot of messaging of like, you know, what grow up and marry grow up and be supported, grow up and write something, something outside of ourselves. It's a big, uh, through line message. So it was like, yeah, I, I kind of thought I nailed it. <laughs> you know, I have I'm my company and I have this guy and I have this gorgeous girl on the way and we have this house and, you know, we would play this fun game. Am I going to have the baby first or is the house going to be ready first? Because it was literally a week away from each other. The, the due date of both of those massive life things. And uh, then it came crashing down. What what red flags were you ignoring? I'm gonna say borderline verbal abuse, just like a an, a, a an unwillingness to acknowledge my feelings and unwillingness to acknowledge my emotions. You know, you mentioned my mother had passed. I would sit and cry because that was still a fresh wound, and now it's 20 years later, and I still cry. And he would say things like, "When are you gonna be done crying about that? Like, can't you go do something else?" Just and it's a reflection of who he is, right? I mean, it's not, it, it, it's, it's his limitation. Um, I wanted to go to the pumpkin patch. I remember distinctly. I wanted to go to the pumpkin patch with my gorgeous new girl and do that pumpkin pictures, you know, put the baby on the pumpkin. Like that's a thing. Um, and he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had to kind of force him into wanting to go. And then he said he'd be back and he left on his motorcycle and he didn't come back until the nighttime. And I was sitting there like waiting to go. And I can, I am feeling this right now because it's like that I feel so sad for that version of myself who was willing to sit there and let that be okay. That's not okay. So it was, it was those types of things that I was experiencing. Yeah. And I, th I thank you for sharing that. And the, the reason I ask is because, I mean, this is, this is a business podcast. This is a podcast about creatives pursuing those things, but what is so often overlooked is the decisions that we make, the partner that we have, uh, the people that we have in our lives, the career we want to have. We make those decisions and then we spend years working to get them. And then when we get there, we often are ready for the next thing or for the different thing or it wasn't quite what we, sh what we thought it was. And no one wants to have that conversation, right? You didn't want to have that conversation with your significant other to say, hey, you know, what's going on? I, I can recall two or th I guess maybe three years ago now. Three years ago, my wife and I went out for a walk one September afternoon. I said, honey, there are red flags all over the place. And I am terrified that if we don't address these things now, in five or 10 years, we're going to look back and go like, that was the moment. Like that was the moment we could have gotten yes. in front of it. That was the moment we could have addressed it. And it's not fun and it's not comfortable and it's, it's, it's revealing. And, but like, you know, at this point in our marriage, we can have those types of conversations. But um, do you believe that, I, I know you're going to say that extracting yourself from that situation so you could become the person that you've become was well worth it. But at that moment, 
were you just afraid to have the conversation? Were you afraid for the costs? What, what, like what was keeping you there? Yeah. Oh, so, so good. Uh, I didn't even know it at the time. That's the thing about that. My lack of worth was so in lack, was so low that I wasn't even conscious that I was tolerating beneath what I deserved. So the ability to even have the conscious awareness to say, let's have a dialogue about these red flags didn't even occur to me because I wasn't seeing myself out of a place of unconditional love and self-respect and self-appreciation, right? Which is really important to understand because that's what victimhood is. That's what powerlessness is. You first have to notice that dissolution was my notice moment. That's what makes it such a gift. It was, it was the thing that shook me to my core that went, what are, what is happening? Whose life is this? What are you doing? This isn't who you are. My father knew it. My sisters knew it. And the whole time that I'm in this relationship, they're like, seriously, Trey, what are you doing? But when you don't want to see it, you don't see it. And, and I think it's beautiful. I mean, that's, this gets us into the juiciest part of, of the journey of life, business and personal. It's all highest good. But no, it felt like highest good does not mean it feels good. Highest good means trust, baby, because it's going to land you somewhere and it's going to be good. This is my this is this is my favorite part of my job because I get the chance to speak to people who I admire and that I look up to and I think you know I'm 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 reading your book having never read written a book but always kind of wanting to going holy smokes I just can't imagine writing something this good and you know we had Dave Hollis on the podcast a few weeks ago and it was the same thing and and everyone I read I'm just like what you guys have done this this is amazing and yet and yet Go back five years, go back 10 years, go back 20 years. The, the, the connection in the thread is, my goodness, we all had to come to this moment of realization that, that to become the person that we feel called to be, right? Like we have that inner drive, that inner spirit. We know we are built for more, but to be able to even achieve that, you have to, um, I guess, die that that version of you has to die to birth this new version of you and it's uncomfortable and it's not and it's painful and it's difficult and and most people don't want to face that and so um you know you can look back and go like wow what a moment i wonder for those of us who are facing those moments for those of us who are in those moments right now what do you what do you, you know you're a coach you're you're a transformational coach you work with people all the time what do you say for those of us who are either in this or you just heard this story and you're getting goosebumps because you realize Tracy is describing me right now yeah uh thank you for this question because it's the core of everything i teach touch and talk about you are a spiritual being having a human experience and i have to start there to really answer this from a place of service and when you learn how to leverage both parts of your being, when you learn how to go high into that spiritual self, that part that's connected to the oneness, that part that believes and knows like they know, like they know it's highest good, baby, bring it on. They're already seeing and existing and experiencing that. They've got you. I need to ask you to be a little less human in the fear part of it. And oh my God, but I'm going through this and watch how your mind wants to justify that position that you're in and just, but Tracy, you don't understand. No, 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 I do. Okay. Like, and really just, just let yourself breathe and go up, right? Breathe and go high and go, okay, wait a second. I am guided. I am supported. There is something bigger than me at play here. And you can define bigger than you, however you want, but it is essential for this journey we're on. And this is when I say journey, journey of entrepreneurship, empire building, you know, parenthood, life, it's all things. You are the common denominator. Okay. Stop feeling like you can operate in silos. Well, this is my entrepreneurial self and this is my spouse self. And okay. You are the asset and you are the center stone of everything that comes out of you. So to really be able to understand on this journey, 
that doesn't look like the flight of an airplane takeoff, the way everybody wants to think it does. Like, oh, it's just a straight, fabulous, angled shot all the way to my desires. Whereas it's really more like a heart rate monitor, right? Up, up, down, 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 up, 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 down, up. It is essential that you are willing to connect to the truth of your spirituality, the truth that you are held and guided and supported and everything is working out for you. Even when you're in a dip moment on that heart rate monitor visual, that is the essential time where you must believe. It's so easy to be chill and like, yeah, everything's happening my highest good. And you're like rocking it out and everything's going well. That's not a test of your belief. Right? Every circumstance that occurs in our human experience is solely there for your ability to work your spiritual journey, for your ability to work your growth, for your ability to show yourself how much you've grown through responding instead of reacting. When you choose that lens, now you're, you're from like a higher place. You're doing life from a much, much higher position and everything just feels better. Can you unpack because you know spirituality gets confused with religion it gets mm-hmm. confused with um i i keep hearing people say woo woo and and i i get it you know nobody wants to be woo woo but um i don't know maybe we need a yeah. little woo woo maybe we need well, a little woo woo if we can push through that let's talk about that let's yeah, talk okay. about that because i actually i recently uh, had several conversations about how i have a lot of missions a lot of missions, Mark. But one of my recent missions is to actually eradicate the words woo-woo from our culture. Can can, I want to eradicate the words imposter syndrome because I feel like if you're you're pushing through, everything should make you feel like an imposter because that's the only way to grow. I know we all hate it, but- No, I love you. I love you. Wait. So here's what we're going to do. Legit. I'm going to come back. We're going to have another conversation because I am in the midst of working on the biggest thought leadership piece I really ha- I've ever worked on as it pertains to calling imposter syndrome out as the total bull lie that it is and what a detriment it is as such a collectively accepted model. So I'll table that, but I am with you a thousand percent. Okay. Listeners, we will circle back around on that conversation later, Coming but, back. but, but let's, let's focus on woo woo then. So, yeah. you know, no one wants to be woo woo, but everyone, you know, I, I don't know. It's just a, a where does this come from? So woo woo is true. It's like your skepticism in action, right? Because to say it's woo woo instantly disconnects you from the truth of your spiritual being. It separates, right? Because now it's like, oh, it's woo woo. It's too soft. What really happens is spirituality flies in the face of our culture and our society and how we were raised Because spirituality says it's already done. It could be easier. The truth of your being is wholeness, abundance, flow, lightness, right? And our culture is very earn it, earn it, run it, get your to-do list to have to-do lists, run it. Like if you observed us as a people from another planet, you would actually think that someone is observing us ready to give out an award for the stressed and the busiest person. Right. You would actually say to yourself, what are these people competing for? The craziest, the most spun out, the most burnt out. I I think I, my take hot take. You ready for this? I think someone observing would go like, oh, um, this is a slave society. And and I know that's a very heavy word, a very heavy word with history and with all kinds of racial things. But, but there are these hidden things that keep us living, wanting, driving, desiring things that don't really matter at the end of the day, competing for things that don't really matter. And I think someone would look back and go like, wow, whoever orchestrated this thing did a really good job of making everyone think they're doing important things that don't matter at all, just so that way someone else could benefit. Good work. That's what I think. A a a thousand percent. And it builds right on what what I think. we're, We're very together on this because everyone's running. Where are we running to, right? And what that really is at the core comes back to the work. Somewhere along the line, something happened, something went down, you don't believe you're enough, and you are just working yourself into your own perceived value, right? I gotta do more, I've gotta earn more, I've gotta make sure people like me, I've gotta people please, I've gotta get be all things to all people, I got it under control, don't worry, I got this. All of these different things, and what lies beneath all of that is your ability to heal your own wound of not feeling enough, 
your ability to hear me when I say to you, like even if you jump on the Tracy train for a second, you woke up today, you're whole, you're worthy, you're enough, done. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to do anything for it. Your worth is your inherent birthright. It cannot get greater or less than based on who you be. It is your divine birthright as a spiritual being having a human experience. You are whole, you are worthy, you are enough, you are lovable, and you are abundant. It's like, oh, sh well, now what do I do with my day if I'm already enough? That's the birthplace of your ability to transform. If we don't knock that out in the beginning, everything else feels like pushing a boulder up a hill only for it to roll back on top of you. I've, I've often said, and, and this analogy has helped me over the last year, but it, it actually doesn't, it doesn't help me right now, actually. I've, I feel like I've outgrown it. But I had this idea that there's a, an old version of me mm -hmm. and um, there's a new version of me. And the new version of me is growth focused and it's exciting and it's abundant and there's so much potential. And the old version of me is, is fixed, right? It's, it's moving from a fixed mindset. It's stuck. Um, it has to deal with all kinds of baggage and stuff I don't want. And so this analogy I had was it, was, it felt like, like if I could just move quick enough, if I could take on enough things, if I can move fast enough, if I can I can do so. I can outrun the old version of me. As long as I stay running, I can outrun this old version of me. But like Carrie, like the end of the movie Carrie, where the hand comes out of the grave at the end, this old version of my life, and that's the people, that's the systems, that's the thinking. This old version of my life is trying to grab at my heel and slow me down and pull me back. And if I don't run, if I don't do things if I don't have a certain morning routine, if I don't exercise a certain way, if I don't do the things that I know are good for me to move towards my new version of my life, that old version of me is just going to hold me back. And that thought used to worry me and scare me because every time that I would slow down, I would feel the old version of me kind of creeping in. And I didn't, I didn't like it. I didn't, I didn't want it. It's, it was, it was uncomfortable. It's mm -hmm. the person who, who, you know, wears a suit every day to work and then stops working there and can wear shorts and a t-shirt or whatever. But then when they go back to work, they threw a suit back on and it just doesn't feel mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. uh, now, that worked for me for a bit. But then I found myself just burning out on, on trying to stay ahead of it, trying to stay yeah. ahead of it. And where I'm, where I'm at now and I'm trying to get there is like you said, you are enough. You are enough. You already have the things you need. You already, you know, your experiences are all there to serve you. Uh, you already have the gifts that you've been given. You have the skill sets that you can develop. You have everything that you need to do the things that you need to do. I'm starting to see that, but it's still, you know, when I hear you and I hear Brene Brown and I hear all of these leaders who are on the other side of it, I just go, I don't know if I believe you. I like, it just doesn't feel like I'm there. I can, I can yeah. rationalize it. I can understand it in my head, but in my heart, it still feels like, I don't think you realize how messed up I am. I'm not enough. And if I don't, and what if, and blah, 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 and da, da, da. And Ugh. that gets us to, you know, you talk about like the rabbit hole of hell, right? Like this, this thing that happens. Can, can you explain a bit about what that is and help people like me who are still not on the other side of this just come to really understand when you say you are enough, how? How do we know that? How can we trust that and believe that? Oh, that's so good. Okay. So there's so many things. First, I want to acknowledge you. Uh, and I want to give you permission to stop running. I want to give everyone permission to stop running. And the reason why it worked for a little bit, but then it feels like it doesn't, is because the way that we truly transform, grow, evolve, right? I foundationally believe and know that our purpose here, not the passion that we get to do or monetize or serve the world with, but our purpose is healing, growing, and expanding. That is our purpose. And it's about healing those things in that old version of you. It's about really giving yourself that space and time to slow down. Why is it so uncomfortable when you slow down? Why is it so uncomfortable to get quiet? Because that's when the shit comes up. And that's when the wounds start to rise. And that's when all the stuff that we haven't honored and healed starts to call for you. And rightfully so. Because we cannot process 
the wisdom of our wounds, trauma, the wisdom of our dips, like on the heart rate monitor again, if we're not sitting and seeing them and acknowledging them and integrating those parts of ourselves. And when you integrate it and you really heal it and you learn to love and extract, like, wow, what a gift that was. It's then that you continue to rise and evolve and iterate into the next level and the next level and the next level. Running is not really a thing. It just feels good short term, right? But then it becomes exhausting. So I invite you and everybody and all of us, because it weaves right into this whole worth enoughness conversation. It's safe for you to slow down. It's safe for you to get in touch with some of those deep wounds that feel so painful. And when you really understand your inner power, you also have a different lens on pain. You don't judge the pain. You appreciate the pain for what it is. One of the first things that I was taught in my coaching journey was pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. So allowing yourself to go back into the wounds that created your not enoughness in the first place and do the healing around that. Go and telling for you, your little boy, what the truth was in those moments, right? The truth is you are always lovable. You are always enough. You are always worthy. It's simply that meaning maker. It's understanding, like I talk about in the book, what happens in our subconscious minds. And immediately we attach to, it, something must be wrong with me. I don't matter. I, I'm a disappointment. I'm not enough. I'm not significant. If I was more enough, then my father wouldn't have left. If I was more enough, then I would have made the soccer team. If I was can, more can you enough. Describe, then, can you describe the meaning maker? Because that was a term, absolutely. That, that, like that whole chapter, and, and this is in the book, Worthy Human, uh, with the subtitle, because you are the problem and the solution. <laughs> but but the meaning maker section, I was like, holy sh**. Like, I, I was listening to your book on this run, and I was like, I feel like I knew it. I could accept it. I never thought about this before. Mm, yes. Yeah. So from third trimester in our mother's womb through around seven to eight years old, we have no conscious mind. We are all subconscious. 24-7, 365, really open up right now. Even if you're listening, you're like, oh, I think I know this. Don't do that. That's your brain trying to block you, like be here with us, right? So here you are, third trimester till seven years old, and you are a video camera turned on 24-7, 365, absorbing, picking things up. And the natural way that our wiring is that it assigns meaning. So you're in a situation where you didn't make the soccer team at five years old and instantly you suck that information in and you go, I didn't make the soccer team. It must mean I suck. If I suck, it must mean I'm not enough. Check, done. Throw it in your, throw it in your suitcase, right? It's like we're each born with the suitcase and it travels with us as we go and all of our that we've accumulated and pulled in, right? Same thing, you're doing great, you're sitting and you're playing, let's say you're four years old and you're really enjoying yourself and your mother walks in and she just yells at you, right? You've no, you don't know, oh, well, my mom just had a bad day and something happened with her boss. You've no, no understanding, there's nothing conscious about it. And boom, in that moment, oh my God, mommy yelled at me, I didn't do something right, that must mean that I don't matter. Okay, that must mean that I'm not enough. Boom, you throw it in there. So what, what happens for all of us is, and it's not like, and no one's immune to this, which is also why it's such a gift, especially for those of us that are here, we're entrepreneurs and we're, we're like, we, we tend to think all external. What's the next strategy? It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. Let me tell you something I know, like I know, like I know that I've seen with every client I've had the blessing to work with. You will never grow your impact, your wealth or your empire faster than you grow yourself ever. Ever. And it requires you loving yourself enough to go back, go back, go back, go back. For some of you, it could be, you know, four decades, five decades, six decades back. And go give that little you the love and the truth where you get to go back into that moment of that example of, you know, your mom just, you know, being a human um, and reacting. And you go back into that moment and you spend time with that little inner child and you're like, hey, I'm back. Did you know that you were enough the whole time? That wasn't about you at all. I love you so much, right? So that's what happens in our meaning maker and it's inevitable. And then we all get to take a look at what lies beneath always, there's no gray, is I'm not enough. The question is, what's your flavor? Mine was I'm not smart enough. 
That's what ah, I struggled. I've with. got that one. <laughs> you got it. You have that no, no. too. <laughs> but but so but for me, it manifested as um, I just had to be the smartest guy. Like mm-hmm. like if I'm not smart enough, if I'm not clever enough, if I don't think quick enough. So I actually got really good grades and I actually like coasted and I did all of that stuff because it was like, it was like, oh, I could, I could be good at this. And then I hit a moment where I just wasn't. And I can remember it. It was, it was grade 12 chemistry. Could not understand it. Could not figure it out. Could not wrap my mind around it. Was failing the class. Got like a 13% on a course. Tried to drop it and they wouldn't let me. And the other day I was talking to my wife about this. I was like, I don't know why I didn't, you know, get a tutor try harder ask for like i like like all these things where now 20 years later i'm like i'm like i could have had a totally different life path i i changed my career path because of that one course because i wanted to be an architect and an engineer but i thought if i can't do grade 12 chemistry i can't do this and it was like anyway that's mm. that's my little rant but no, no I, yeah. I love that rant and i think it's massively serving for everyone so am i not smart enough I did, uh, instead of trying to overcompensate an intellect, which is like, right, I decided I just need to be the coolest. Ah, we get back to the cover band now. (laughs) Right, I need to be the coolest. I need to have the best personality, right, which I achieved, best personality of like 950 kids in my senior class, right? Um, And I sabotaged my entire academic life. I didn't try. I skipped second period. I didn't even attempt. I, I have no college degree. I never went to formal traditional uh, university ever. Neither did I. Right. Because I, I, but it's so interesting to talk about in this context because you can see how your view of it's, it's your self image. It's your self concept. It's what you believe about yourself, right? You will always live that out. You will never outperform what you believe about yourself or about anything else you're trying to attain. Right. So it's just such a gorgeous conversation to have. And it's also supportive of the earlier conversation. Everything happens for our highest good. Look at who you are now and how you're serving and how conscious you are. Look at what I'm doing now as a result of all of my worth issues and my wounds and how I get to show up in this space. What a gift. We're talking about two sides of the same thing here. So I don't want to muddle things up too much, but but I just I had to ask Tracy a follow up question. And that's based off the fact that, you know, we're talking about my high school chemistry class and and my own stories, but, but me being in chemistry shifted my entire life. It shifted me away from the becoming the architect and the engineer that I wanted to become to going to film school. And then now here I am doing this. And so in, in one way it, it served me because I can't go back and I can't change things. But in another way, I'm not sure if it served me because I allowed fear to make the decision on my behalf. And so when I reflect on this life moment, when you reflect on your life moments, I I think it's easy to beat yourself up for all the things that you didn't do or that you should have done or you could have done, but in some way they still served you. And so I'm I'm not sure how to wrap my mind around this. How do we hold both of these truths? How do we hold the fact that that these competing thoughts, that the things that you did for the wrong reasons or the things that you did that didn't work out still somehow have served you in your life? It's choosing, uh, it's more beautiful lessons in your spiritual journey. It's choosing through the lens of lesson. It's choosing through the lens of, um, there's a beautiful gentleman and we'll have to find his name. He just put a book out with Oprah and he coined a phrase called post-traumatic wisdom. And his whole concept, he's a psychotherapist, I believe, or a psychologist, his whole concept is recognizing that in everything that went down, even if it was one of those moments that felt less than good, um, there is a wisdom inside of there that you get to extract. So if you are looking through life and you are being to yourself and mean to yourself and you're shooting on yourself, which side note is a straight shot to shame and guilt. Let's just be clear, right? Like the word should is based in shame and guilt. And if you choose to continue the habit of using it, you are rooting deeper any shame and guilt that you haven't healed through. It's important to say that. So If you are being mean to yourself and looking down on it, you're really kind of coming at everything through a lower level consciousness. You're in a powerless 
perspective. So you're then you're going to continue to like, well, well, I'll just be mean to myself because you're also living in a low level consciousness of the harder I am on myself, you know, the, the more I'll actually get done. We have this really warped relationship with self-flagellation and just like I call it the shitty committee in your head. It's in the book, right? <laughs> I love that. You know, or you can go higher into a higher level consciousness and look back at all of those things and choose to look through the lens of higher consciousness, of lessons, of gifts, of recognizing that in order to live a life of satiation and success, there must be dips and ebbs and flows and massive glorious fall on your face failures and moments I mean, I have so many moments. We could be in a podcast for three weeks. I could tell you all the moments where it's like, oh my God, I did what? You did what? Oh my God, what? Right? And recognizing that self-forgiveness has to be a part of who you are. Ooh, let's let's talk about forgiveness. But real quick, the, the book that you were referencing is What Happened to You? And you. it was with Oprah and Dr. Bruce Perry. Thank you, Bruce Perry. Yes. yes. Phenomenal concept he introduces there. Post-traumatic wisdom, so juicy. So let's let's talk about forgiveness a little bit. Um, do do you think do you think it's some people just forgive easier than others? Like they forgive others, they forgive themselves, and it just it's one of those skill sets or personality traits or something where it's just like you know they don't hold on to things, so it's just easy come, easy go, easy to forgive. And then others are like just you know it's almost it's almost like an argument <laughs> like if i yes. if i forgive then it justifies or i'm a i'm a i'm they can walk all over me or it's like i'm not i'm not, i'm going to hold on to this lack of forgiveness i do believe that for some people forgiveness is easier than others and i foundationally believe that everyone needs to learn forgiveness as a skill because for someone that might forgive easily externally, they might not forgive internally, right? Forgiveness must start from self-forgiveness. You cannot exclude yourself as, as, as being forgiven for all the moments and all the things that we've all done. It's such an essential component of having a healthy relationship with yourself, which is the most important relationship of your life. And going back to the whole, like, you are the common denominator. You know, there's everything that matters in life we were never taught. Yeah. It's freaking maddening so, to me. Hold on. You are the most important relationship in your life. Who thinks that? People that work with me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's 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 no, gotta really. be it's gotta be, you know, you, you extract yourself from it and you start to look at life in more of this spiritual lens. Like like is it better to be rich or happy? And people will say, Well, both. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is it better to be busy? Or, um, or at peace and you know, well, why can't we be at peace when we're like, so, so like we always want to have this structure and framework where it's like, I want it all, but, but if there's not enough time or energy or something always caught comes at the cost of something else, um, it makes sense to say like your most important relationship is with yourself. The most important thing you can focus on is making sure that you feel a way to perform the way that you want to perform, to get the things that you want to get, to do the things that you have to like, like this all makes sense, but I don't think anyone thinks this way. I know, but that's the problem. Look at the state <laughs> of the world. Like the, we're, we're here in a consciousness revolution. One of the things that the lit factor is here to really do is break down old constructs and paradigms and build up new ones that are much more akin and aligned to like, you know, what we're all keep saying that we want. So have, having your relationship with you be the highest priority is not only a gift for you, it's a gift for every single person in your life. It's a gift for every client. It's a gift for every business partner. It's a gift for your spouse. It's a gift for your kids. There, this whole like the martyrdom thing that we grew up with and, and you know, let me just like worry about everybody but myself is such a disservice. But actual fact, when you prioritize yourself, you're prioritizing your energy. You're prioritizing your emotional state. You're prioritizing your self-forgiveness, your ability to you know, expand your self image, which then allows you to show up. Like I'm saying this, I have three daughters and magnificent husband and incredible friends and family. I have a magnificent community that I wake up and serve every day. And I am more important than everybody through the lens of my ability to feel my best and show up and serve and be a channel for what my clients need and to be focused and present with my teenagers when they're like, mom, can you? Yes. You know, be able to be with my husband intimately at night. If I am 
not prioritizing me, everybody loses. And that's the truth for every one of us. At what cost though? What, Every, everything what comes cost? with a cost. No, cost. So no. What, no cost. No cost. What what cost could there be? What um, cost could there be? People the, that maybe take advantage of the fact that I'm not prioritizing myself and I lose some of those relationships. Sweet. Because I'm not I'm not willing to betray myself to make somebody else comfortable. And I don't want any of you to be either. Right? This is what it means to foundationally. There is no cost because the only cost there could be would be loss. Of maybe situations, right? And right size me here of situations, people's relationships. But if I'm going to lose something because I'm honoring myself, bye. What am, what am I not saying? My job is to challenge you. Right? <laughs> Your no, job I love to answer it. The but, but I'm, I'm, I'm really sitting here going, like, really, it's like either way, you it's, know. You know what it is? It's a loss of the things that we think are important. And so, ah, so yes. you, you know, yes. you, you think, you think it's important to look a certain way, to act a certain way, to be a certain way, to feel a certain way, because we're all walking around, you know, um, grownups are supposed to do a certain thing, right? You know, um, if you're at this, in this role, in this position, you know, do you know how, how many times I've asked people and I still ask them, I'm coming up on my 15th anniversary for my agency, 2006, I started my company, I was 23 years old. We're coming up on 15 years in a few weeks. And just in September, I was at a business event where I was speaking to an entrepreneur where I asked them how they knew they were doing entrepreneurship correctly. Because 15 years into this, I still feel like I am not built to be an entrepreneur, right? My, my Myers-Briggs profile says that I'm the least likely to be an entrepreneur. Um, I'm driven by fear. I, I'm not, I'm not action or I'm saying all these things that I shouldn't be yeah. saying out loud, but, but you know, for the, <laughs> for, for, for the purpose of this, I'm saying all these things out loud, but, but, and I'm still asking these questions because I, I feel like that there's a right way to do it and I'm not doing it the right way. I feel like there's um, something that should happen and, and clearly I don't have it or I'm not good enough. And I know that it's total bull. And I can step back, but, but these are the things that it's costing us. It's costing us what society or what our friends or what our family of origin or what, what we think it is that we're supposed to do, you know, I we're know, supposed to live life case, a certain way. Okay. Yes. I'm with you. I'm with you. And now I've, it's, I've so, there's so much, my body's like vibrating, um, because I'm going to then replace that with all of those are gains. There's no cost. There's no cost because the whole way that we've been concerned, we got to do it right. Should supposed to, you know, we've got to keep up this way. Like if we're not doing things differently than our grandparents and our parents, we are failing miserably. Like the whole idea is for us to get better and more evolved and more conscious and break down the paradigms of it, limited them and take a look at what is going on and what is opportunity so we can change and change only happens, right? What we are here to do is change the frequency of the world to change the world. Change only happens through individuals changing, showing up, breaking down things that were dripped on them, being the full ex expression of who you are. So losing the supposed to's, the shoulds, the relationships that were gaining the fact that you had no boundaries, people that only liked you because you were contortionisting yourself in just a certain way to be professional. Bye. Those are all gains. There is no cost. There is no, I'm going on record. There is no cost. Our sole responsibility is being the fullest expression of who each one of us are. And when we start to do that, it gives such blanket permission for the, the girl and boy and an individual to the left and the right to do the same exact thing. And now we're living in a world where people are being who they are. Yeah, I want that world. You work with a lot of women. I do. Women start doing this and they're going to be called a Okay. For putting themselves first, for for standing up, for speaking up, more so than men. You know, my True. wife and I have been have been watching these things for the last, you know, since COVID opened up and the pandemic opened up, we would go to um, the amusement park. And I would say to my my 15-year-old daughter, I would say, walk like a man. Now, I don't mean walk like a man. What I mean is when you're in a crowd, you walk straight and everyone else moves out of your way. Mm-hmm. 
That's what I do. Yeah. Now, I will yeah. step out of the way if there's, if there's you know, if, if, if someone is clearly there, I will step out of the way. But otherwise, I just walk. I walk mm-hmm. and people move out of the way for me. My daughter, who's walking beside me, is, is sidestepping and hustling and saying sorry and apologize. I'm like, just walk like a man. Just, just walk. People will move out of your way. Trust me. Mm-hmm. You know, and if you need to step out of the way, you do. Um, you know, say what it is that you think. Say yes. what it is. Talk, talk like a man, right? Say what it is you think. Speak with confidence. If you're not sure, say you're not sure. Like, just do these things. But my, my girls, my wife, the women in our life, it's a big deal for a woman to be. Mm-hmm. Right, but that's only if you care what people think mm. of you. Right, so what I would tell your daughter, because I have them too, I have a daughter, right? Tits up, shoulders <laughs> back, girls. Let's okay, I, I will not say those words out <laughs> right? loud to my 15-year-old. You will okay. not say that, but you can send her to me. I have a 15-year-old too. It's like just like, you know, because I hear what you're saying, but also I want to challenge you into don't give that word, don't give that messaging, right? It's like, walk like ah, a man. I see what you're are. saying. See, I, I, yes, I, I did even make right? the mistake of saying walk like a man because it's not even that. It's just walk like Rachel. Rachel deserves to walk straight. Yes, yes. It's like, the, the, Rachel's your daughter's name? Yes. Okay. Rachel's the middle name of my 15 year old. Um, it's like saying to her, I want her to walk through life like this. Hi, I'm Rachel. You're welcome. <laughs> Like that's it. Right. Oh, I and love that's that. the whole air. It's like, you know, statistically, I believe now we're one in 405 trillion scientifically in terms of the odds being each one of us individually who we are like truly. Right. So if we kind of all connected to that every day, right. Then it'd be like, Oh, wait a second. Like I'm a gift. Like you're welcome. Hi. How are I'm Trey. Hi. Right. And, and to have that about you and for the people that, that want to judge that as it's it's like okay since i don't judge myself your judgment doesn't even occur to me because side golden nugget all judgment is self-judgment so if i don't believe that about me you can say whatever the hell you want till the cows come home i don't even it's not even in my periphery because i don't hold that in myself that is what relationship with self is so essential for right it's your whole identity people are always gonna have opinions he's a dick, she's an dick, she's a dick, whatever Whatever, like I, I'm not oh, moving on to putting my focus and attention in what serves me. <laughs> We've just taken a beautiful little side trip with a lot of tactics, but I actually want to, at this point, circle back on Tracy's story because she was facing separation as a single mom. She had to go out and get a job, which, which becomes a well-paid vice president role, which in itself becomes a cage because while she's earning multiple six figures, it wasn't what she wanted to do. It wasn't her true calling. And so Tracy started out this whole conversation by saying that she teaches lessons that she's learned the hard way. And we just got a little glimpse of the current version of Tracy, but I wanted to know how she practically moved from that old version of her, the version of her in that VP role, the version of her that feels trapped and caged that unhappy corporate version of her? How did she practically move from there to the version that we now see? The first step, which I didn't realize until now I've reflected on this, my whole journey, right? Uh, Was identical to the first step on the garage floor, but in a different method. The, the, The mainstay was I was silent again. Okay, so just like I was on the garage floor and I had exerted everything and I just laid there and my higher self came through and she's like, girl, what you gonna do, right? That happened again after I had um, identified my soul was sucking and that there was a deeper calling, right? And I was in this VP job and it was another one of those moments, interestingly, where I was like, but I did everything. Like I have the corporate job. Like, oh, I'm a single mother. I own a townhouse. I have a car. Like my husband jokes around. He's like, I thought you were loaded. You owned a townhouse. I'm like, relax. Um, so, you know, to be in that position and then to have the calling, right. To feel like, okay, I really do want to do something bigger and doing a lot of research on it, right. Figuring out that it really was coaching that this field of helping others access their limitless potential. That's what I knew and sat in fear for two years over, oh my God, what if I suck? What if it's too much of a risk? What if I can't get a great job like the one I have now? What if nobody likes me? What if I'm not as good as I think I am, right? So I'm clear, but I'm in, deci- I'm, I'm in indecision. And then one night I'm away with 
my husband, David, and I'm sitting on a balcony overlooking the ocean. We live really close to the ocean in Florida and it's pitch black. You can see the white caps coming over the waves and I'm silent. And like, there she is again, my higher self, which isn't just like for clarity's purposes. It's not like a real voice for me. I hear her. She like comes up through my solar plexus, like in my body. Like, it's just like this communication. She's like, yeah, uh, you're not willing to get to the end of your life and not having gone for this. Like, what are you doing? And it was that like mm, moment. And I got up in that moment, walked inside the hotel because I had my laptop with me and emailed the admissions director. I had been, God bless this man, two years, hemming and hawing, I'm in, I'm out. I don't know, I don't write all of that. And then I did it and manifested a layoff from that VP job like four months later, kicked off the Lit Factor September of 2016. And here we are. Like it was that kind of thing. But to answer your question, it was my paralyzation of by fear that got me so obsessive about, I don't understand, why is this happening? Why can I be so excited about something and so called to something and not move on it at all? Like, how can I be like Monday? Hell yes, I'm in. And Tuesday, like, uh, uh, sit back down. You're doing nothing. Like, what is that? And that's when I started to really learn about human wiring and fear and risk perception and biology of it. And that is a key element of the work that I do because through my two year waste slash gift, I can now help you just circumvent fear like that and change your relationship and do the thing. Yeah. I mean, I, I have a quote from your book, which again is a version of you that I'm not even, I, I can't even perceive, right? This fear used to paralyze me, fear of the unknown, fear of success, fear of failure, fear of being good enough. You name it, I feared it. It's funny, even as I write this, I'm smiling and laughing because none of those things are real for me anymore. And it's just like, I want that. <laughs> I want to be on the other side of that. And so that was it within the book in the section where you started to talk about radical personal responsibility. Ooh, that's an uncomfortable thing. Ooh, that's a hard thing. Um, I would say that's almost like a next level thing. Walk, walk me through what that is, this idea of radical personal responsibility. It is a next level thing. Uh, and it's a huge core of the book and why I subtitled it, you're the problem and the solution and why I intentionally couple the word like worthy and problem together. So radical personal responsibility is complete comprehensive ownership of all of your shit. It is the foundational understanding that you are the cause of the effect. Whatever is going on in your experience is due to something that's going on inside of you. But isn't it more fun to blame other people for everything? <laughs> if you'd like to stay a victim, absolutely. Ah! <laughs> yes, right? And that really is it, because one of the things we get to do uh, when you start to experiment and try on with radical personal responsibility is taking a good, hard look at the honesty behind the honesty. Right, taking a good hard look at where am I blaming? Where am I? Where's my laundry list of excuses? What reasons do I have that I haven't done X, Y, Z? Let me start to pay attention and call myself out because calling yourself out with love is another part of radical personal responsibility on how I'm justifying my limit right now. You will be astonished at what opens up for you when you love yourself deeply enough to call yourself out. Right? And it is such a direct tie to your worthiness, your enoughness, your wholeness, which all three of those words are the same thing, right? You're whole, you're worthy, you're enough. Because if you aren't willing to heal the wounds that are driving your not enoughness, your ego and your psyche will block your ability to take that level of responsibility because your ego goes, hell no, I'm not going to make myself wrong because then I suck again, right? I'm not going to take ownership for that because that's just going to affirm my not enough story, right? So it is imperative and a requirement in order to reach the highest levels of yourself to be able to take radical personal responsibility and be able to take the depth of it that I talk and coach about, you have to embrace the truth of your wholeness and your worth first. And so is it simply awareness is kind of a good first step? 
being aware of of this of this new standard, this new level, you find yourself making excuses and go, "Oh, right, I'm." I'm not going to blame other people for stuff anymore. Or is there like, do you start journaling? Like, how do you, how do you start baking this into your life? Okay. So, well, so many things, but right away, I want you to just do a quick list. What I want on one side and why I don't have it on the other. Right. That's the first go. Like put it down on paper. It's amazing what happens. Like what I want or why I don't have it. Okay, and for all everybody you, listening and watching, everybody, everybody listening and watching, I'm guilty of this. Everyone, everyone is guilty of this, and they won't admit it. When someone in a book, uh, on a podcast, when they tell you to do something, nobody stops. They just keep on listening, and they never circle around. They never do the activities. They don't do the work. So pause right now and make up a list. <laughs> Two things: right. what you want and why you don't have it. A thousand percent. And I love that you're calling that out because, you know, you wouldn't do that if I was like a physical trainer and you said, okay, Trace, I'm going to come with you. I want six pack abs and I'm going to put you on this whole plan, right? You wouldn't like come meet me at the gym for three days and then call me a week later and be like, where's my six pack, (laughs) right? But in growth, it's just, and it's really, I can get into it. It's a, it's a function of the mind. The mind shows us loss and not gain and all these other neuroscientific understandings. But, you know, when you do the work, it works 100% of the time. Like really know that there is who you've been is zero impatient of who you're becoming. Your capacity is there. There's nothing wrong with you. You're not broken. You can have it. It's safe to have it. And you do have to work. You have to show up and do the thing. So like Mark just said, you're going to start, you're going to write what I want and why I don't have it. And then I'm going to challenge you because your first go at why I don't have it is bullshit. <laughs> Your first go at why I don't have it is just a little bit too surface for transformational, you know, uh, efficacy. So example, like why I don't have it. Um, I don't have a, I don't, I don't have uh, seven figures in my business. Let's say that was somebody's okay. Why I don't have it. My industry is really, really noisy and it's hard to get to that level of revenue. That's like a really nice try, but it's crap. Okay. (laughs) I need you to go underneath it into the honesty behind the honesty, which really is, oh God, I don't believe that level of success is for me. And I'm afraid to make more parent, more money than my parents. Boom. Now I can do something with that because we have, we've, we've really, um, extracted what's happening in your deep down, what's going on in your subconscious, what's happening in your core that's driving your emotions and your thought process and your behavior and shift it. Is there, um, is there like a feeling or a reaction? You know, like I'm a big fan of um, the Enneagram and we don't have to get too much into that, but, but there's this, um, I wouldn't even say it's a principle, but I tell people it. If you find your Enneagram profile, it's a personality profile type thing, and you're excited, you haven't landed on it. If you are uncomfortably raw, exposed, and ashamed, or nervous, or angry, you've probably hit on something now, because now we're getting to the core work. Now we're getting to the stuff where you're like, oh, oh gosh, that is that is terrible. No, perfect. So, so in this experience, right, we're writing out all these lists and excuses, uh, and there's the excuses we're comfortable with. You know, when I started, I talked about starting my business 15 years ago, I remember sitting across from a coach where I said, I cannot grow sales. He said, hire a salesperson. He said, I can't afford a salesperson. And he gave me this look like, like he just, he, he could not comprehend. He could not comprehend what, what I meant. He's like, well, I'm a small business and this is my current revenue. And he's just like, hire a salesperson. I'm like, but I don't have the money. Like it's the chicken and the egg. And I was like, and, and that moment always stuck with me because as I went on, I hired a salesperson. I figured out how to do it. I got money. I made it work. It, it, it opened up all kinds of things. And I remembered that look he gave me because it was, it was a look of confusion. Like he was not, we were not speaking the same language. He was on the other side of this roadblock. I had this roadblock and he just did not understand what I was talking about. And so as we come up with these lists, we're going to come up with all these amazing excuses. They may not, but what, what are we going for? What are we, what's the feeling where we're like, oh gosh, we oh, just yeah. hit it. <laughs> yeah. When you know you've hit your honesty behind your honesty, you are uncomfortable physically. There's a part of you, depending on like the topic that you're working around, that kind of feels like a little bit nauseous. Like uh, you have this moment like, oh my God, that's what I think? (sighs) Holy shit. Like, I I don't even think I want to say that out loud to myself or even like my sister or my best friend. It's like that kind of deep, like your ego's first go is shame. That's how deep 
what you just rooted was, right? So really just going, whoa, okay. The level of discomfort will always, always, whether it's an RPR, radical personal responsibility or anything else, the level of discomfort will always affirm the growth. Uh, That's what we seek. Yeah. We gotta have that. And so it's like, it's like, yeah. And and this is what I love because you're actually just confirming when I feel that um, I've done it often enough in the last uh, few months where I'm like, I get really excited (laughs) where I'm like, I'm like, Oh, Oh, I feel terrible. Who can I share this with? (laughs) Wife, wife, come over here. I have this deep, dark secret that I just realized. (laughs) Yes. Because that is when you can create a shift. That's when things are going to change, right? I mean, it's not the fact that the word comfort zone, we're now immune to it because it's so used, but it's because it's the truth. If you're feeling comfortable, there's not, there's no healing growth or expansion going on, right? You're just in where you are. You're in the same land. So really inviting that level of discomfort is important. And the other thing I I wanted to speak to, because you were explaining, like when you were in that scenario with the coach, you didn't want to hire a salesperson. It's also really important too. It's not, you're not, we're not intentionally lying to ourselves. Be aware of your shitty committee here that wants to make you feel bad for what you realize. That's not what we're down for, right? It's like, hold on a second. You are working with a mind that's wired to show you loss. And you're working with a mind that populates your thoughts based on past experiences you've had. So you're an entrepreneur who's looking to grow your revenue and it's either you sell, which pushes you out of your comfort zone, or you hire a salesperson, which causes you to take an action you don't have. Your mind doesn't have evidence that, oh, Mark's hired a salesperson and not died from it before. Like it's, so the thoughts that are offered from our mind are only derived from the reference that it has of the past experience that we've had, right? Which is what makes mindset work really good, effective mindset work. So magical. That's what makes the platitudes change your thoughts, change your life actually real, right? Because you need to, we need to think beyond who we've been to generate the potentials that we keep saying we want. We have to literally jump beyond our current thought process and start to think, think thoughts out of thin air that we've never thought before and start to feed our mind the thoughts that we need to think that's relevant to what we say we want instead of just like listening to our thoughts all day and wondering why we're not where we want to be. I I feel like it's a safe place. I'm asking permission, even though I probably shouldn't. Can I share something with you that I haven't shared with anyone before? Oh my God. Other than, other than my, other than my wife. And um, we'll see how this goes. Maybe, maybe I'll cut this. Maybe I won't, but, um, the optimistic part of me is so sure of how long I have in life, of how I haven't even scraped my potential, of uh, the growth that can happen. And I can even use the last year or two as reference to say, look at what has happened. If I can do this, oh my goodness, I can do so much. And I can think so much bigger and go so much bolder and do so much more than I'm even able to imagine at this point in my life. And then the other part of me goes, maybe um, I'm the wrong type of crazy and I'm so crazy that I've convinced myself of this and I'm so crazy and charismatic that I've tricked everyone in my life into thinking this is a good idea. But I don't even realize that I'm not only tricking everyone in my life, I'm even tricking myself because I'm just that crazy. And I, I... I don't know. I've had this feeling for like a year or two now, and I don't know how to articulate. I didn't know how to articulate it up till very recently, but but that's one of those things where it's like, what if I'm just so crazy? I'm thinking that that I've managed to trick everyone, including myself. Has that yes. fear ever hit you? Uh, all day, every day. Oh, really? <laughs> oh my God! So here's the thing. I'm so happy you shared that. Um, it's a, first of all, it's a gift. It's a gift to me to be able to receive it. And I, I, I'm holding that space and I want to just acknowledge that it's a gift to everybody who's listening and it's the biggest gift to you. Congratulations. You have a very healthy functioning fear response. Okay. Okay. That is all that's happening here. And this is exactly like we, we tend to think we're like, Oh, I'm going to play a bigger game, but we can't play a bigger game and continue to think small. Our thinking has to match the game that we're ready to play. 
and recognizing that all that is, that beautiful, maybe I'm crazy, you know, maybe everybody else has believed me too, right? All, all of that, those are simply fear thoughts. That's, that's all that is, is your mind body's got like, all right, cool, let's just pull Mark down a little bit. Let's bring him back a little bit, you know, because your mind and body is wired to keep you the same. We have to realize, we always talk about like, okay, we're wired for safety, but you need to recognize that what that means in our potential is the same. Safe equals the same. So that is literally your mind going, okay, I'm, oh good, he's attaching to it. Oh yeah, look, he was going to go do that thing. Now he's not doing that thing. This is perfect. That whole he's crazy thing, let's keep populating thoughts like that because that's really working and he's attaching to those thoughts and he's staying the same, right? And just to recognize at face value, Mark, that those thoughts, anything your mind offers you, arrives from three places only. Fear, ego, and past experience. Okay? Fear, which all of those thoughts, if you sat and identified you'd be like, yeah, totally, that's ego, that's fear, that's past experience. And that is what makes never believing a thought you think truth. Not just like a nice like thing we could joke about, but really understanding, wow, when I attach to any of that, that my mind automatically gives me, I feel crazy, I shrink a little, and I kind of suck myself back on how big my potential really is. Wow, that's so interesting. Okay, cool. So I'm going to write those thoughts out. I'm going to get rid of them. And instead, I'm just going to close my eyes for a moment and I'm going to connect with the next level version of Mark who is living in the reality of that dream. Like, look at him go. And you start to see my fate. Like, like when you connect to it emotionally, you start the visualization process inherently. And now you're in it and you're like, oh, hell yeah. And then you simply, okay, well, what does he think? That level of you, Mark, that's already living in the reality of that big ass dream that is yours. Because if you can imagine it, it's yours to claim. Fact. What does he think? What thoughts does he think intentionally? Well, how does he feed his mind to support and be congruent with that big ass dream that is yours to claim? Is that a rhetorical question? Or? No, no, no. I'd like oh. you to answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. I was, I was, I was not clear. I, know, I was I leaving know. it for pause to like to let it really like soak in. Um, yeah. I, 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 you know, when I'm, when I'm feeling the, the bold version of me, the optimistic version of me, I think I'm crazy like a fox. I think I'm the right type of crazy. I think I'm the right mix, um, of, of all of my skill sets. And when I go back through my past experiences, I realize that everything was leading to this point and that, um, that everything was for me and it's amazing. It's the other side is the sense of duty and responsibility, right? That's, that's, that's how I manifest it. It's, it's like, well, well, I am leading people. I can't let them down. I uh, have a, a family to support. I have in my mind, this is going to sound, again, okay, I shouldn't preface it, but I have a legacy to build and to leave for future generations. Like, like that is the responsibility. And so if I don't make the right moves, if I don't do things the right way, if I don't, mm -hmm. if I don't, if I don't okay. um, uh, uh, honor the gifts I've been given that I'm to impart on others then I am being foolish and silly and all of those other things. And so the one side of me goes like, I can't wait for what's next. And the other side of me goes, don't, you know, make sure that you have a gift that you still can give to future people and future generations and you're honoring them and you're, you're, you're doing all that stuff. And that's, that's that tension mm, that I have. Okay. There's so many things I need to say to you. <laughs> thing one. Therapy session. Thing, I love you. <laughs> thing one, respons being responsible is lack in disguise. What is that? Mean? We, oh, I have to be okay. I have to be responsible. Yeah. That's like our 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 forefathers, our patriarchal upbringing, all the influence, right? It's like lack and scarcity, but I have to be responsible because when we're responsible, right, that is not going after it. That's not believing in the truth that everything's working out for you. That's not that's not embodying the truth of your abundance, which is the truth, right? Which is collaboration over competition, which is putting yourself out there. Being responsible is a really, really widely accepted, oh yeah, but I understand you don't want to go take that big leap for that dream because you're going to be responsible, right? Which really translates to like scarcity, huh. right? Because, oh my God, what if it doesn't happen? So it's, good. It's, yeah, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing is I was listening to you and the whole time through my lens, 
I was like, yeah, these are all the reasons why he has to play bigger. <laughs> you want to be there for everybody. You want to set up a legacy. You want to honor everybody around you. Like, could you agree that the most important thing for us to do for the people that we love, first the nucleus of our families, and then all of the beautiful humans that hang out with us and trust us, that the single most important thing we can do is play as big as we possibly can so that we can show everybody what's possible and have ourselves utilized to our fullest in this lifetime. I, I want to say yes. And then in the back of my mind, I immediately thought, as long as you're still there for them. What story is your mind offering that's going to going take and you doing away? that stuff takes me away from them. And then if I'm if I'm Do doing this stuff, I'm not I'm not there for them. And can you recognize that that's an optional thought? Just because mm -hmm. you think it doesn't make it real and doesn't make it true. Yep. No, I can. Right. And, that, and that's the, but that's the power of mindset. Like really, that's the power of thought work to be able to go, okay, no, 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 no. So if I believe, if I go after this big thing and utilize myself and in my capacity, which side note is really what shows our daughters. That's really what shows our kids. I am, I just got the glimpse of Taylor's senior, uh, her college essay. And that's what she wrote about. Like watching my mother ascend from oh. an unemployed single mother with me as a baby to building a seven figure empire out of nothing yeah. has shown me what I'm capable of. Do, do I make dinner? No. Do I sit down with her every night? No, I'm quality over quantity, but I am willing to go, wait a second. How do I serve and love the most? Use me. We are here to do big things. It is our core responsibility to do them and to not believe that thought that makes you go, it's going to take me away from no, in actual fact, it's going to make me my fuller expression. It's going to make me more available. It's going to make you an expander for everybody in your life. Thank you. I mean, like, like I'm just going to like, ah, soak it in uh, podcast audience. It, it is. And it's a whole, it's a whole different, you know, it's, it's a paradigm shift, but that's what it, that's the imperative for us. We have to shift the paradigms, right? We have to go from the way we were raised to believe into not only breaking them down, but constructing new paradigms and new models so that it can be different for our kids' kids. Like, isn't like that to me, that's my biggest push. Like, how do we change generations? Really, really, we have to be different. And I hope, you know, listeners, there's, there's something in this conversation that I just want to like take a moment. I don't, I don't usually take a moment right now to step back, but you know, I, my, my background is in marketing and every company that I sit with, every entrepreneur that I sit with for, for, from like 2008 until like 2015 was like, Oh, who do you like? And it was like Apple, right? Oh, we love Apple. And they would just list brands, the same brands. And then it became Tesla. And it's like, everyone likes the same people. Why do they like it? Well, they like the advertising, they like the marketing because they're creative, which takes a certain amount of boldness. They're simple and clear and to the point and have feeling and have tone and they stand for something and they make really great products and they try a lot of different things. And like, so all of this stuff I'm wrapping around is just like courage. And then they go to launch a campaign and they, and, and they don't, they're not willing to be as bold. They're not willing to try as many things. They're not willing to be as simple or clear or courageous, or they're not willing to invest in the parts. They're not willing to, they're not willing. Like, they cut and it's, death by a thousand little cuts. And then we launch something and it doesn't work. It doesn't hit. It doesn't live up to expectations. And I go, well, what did you expect? I mean, the people that you look up to have done the work and you are uncomfortable to do it. I share that to say, I'm, watch I'm watching you, Tracy, and it's like, you've done the work. You know, I look at the people that I look up to, um, you know, like I'm, I'm deep diving on Phil Jackson right now, you know, the, the legendary coach. Oh, like, like absolutely. What an amazing, remarkable man and the number of people he impacted. And I'm going like a few levels deep. Like I'm reading the books that impacted him in the 60s and 70s because I want to know what impacted him. And so I, I, I love this, but, but it, boy, is it making me uncomfortable. But then I go like, okay, it's not enough for me to look up to Phil Jackson and then not be willing to to ask the tough questions or do the hard work or even have these types of conversations or moments. Cause then I'm just like these old clients I used to have who looked up to these remarkable people, but then death by a thousand little cuts and you're left with yeah. like a, a really bad imitation of it. So yeah, 
I just, I, I want to thank you for, for sharing, you know, for, for giving me that, <laughs> that, that free little, that free little coaching session. Cause it, it means something to me, but also, um, you know, these are the types of conversations I typically have with people over dinner. They get really intimate. They get really deep really, really quickly. We don't always put them on the podcast, but, um, but this is the type of stuff that we have to work through if we want to, if we want to be the type of people that we look up to, you know, I look up to Phil Jackson. Great. Am I willing to do the work that he did to get there? Or do I, am I just going to live the rest of my life kind of admiring him and then wondering why I'm not getting any results? Yeah. And I really appreciate that you just said that because that's kind of like the North star of everything when it comes to, you know, living your best life and transforming and all the beautiful things that, you know, many of us will post memes about, but who are you being behind that? You know, it's, it's like what you're saying. And, and here's the thing about what I'm saying right now. I don't actually have a judgment of what you choose or what you don't choose. That's your life to each their own. Um, I do want you to be really, really clear that the only truth with a TH that there actually is, is death. Used to be death and taxes, but you know, pay your taxes or not, that's your choice. Which means that you will have that day. And it's actually the opening line of my TEDx and the closing line of my book. On your, on the last, uh, someone once told me the definition of hell. On your last day on earth, the person you became will meet the person you could have become. You're going to have that moment where you're about to take your last breath and you're going to look back on your life. It's the natural human condition to just reflect in that moment. And you're going to either be like, yes, I did, I did it. I, I, I played, I fell on my face. I showed up. I, I used my, it was amazing. You have all these moments that flush through and satiate you, or you're going to look back and you're going to go, I, I read the books and I did it. Like I, I said, I wanted a lot of things and I felt inspired sometimes but I never really honored myself enough to do the work. And that's what I believe it comes down to. It's your ability to believe it's possible for you. It's your ability to believe that it is your birthright. Deservancy, which is a lit factor word. It's not a real word. Deservancy. You deserve it all. It is safe for you to have it all. And you have everything you need inside of you to actualize whatever it is that you say you want and that's what I want for everybody most of all, right? Is to really understand like, yeah, you can. You can have life however you want it. And if that means selling suntan lotion on the beach, go do it, yes, right? Like whatever your definition of satiated, holistically successful life is, go do that. Well, listeners, we have our marching orders, don't we? And at this point, I really actually want to encourage you to pick up a copy of Tracy's book, Worthy Human, for two reasons. First, and I told Tracy this actually after our recording, when we when we stopped recording, a bunch of the stuff in this book are, are ideas and concepts that I've actually heard from others, but I've never heard with this direct, no-nonsense approach that Tracy takes. And so that really helped cut through and, and make everything really meaningful to me. And then second, having spent a few days with her in person back in October, uh, and which I think you can see in this conversation as well. She's just an awesome woman. So for those two reasons, pick up a copy of the book. Okay, three key takeaways from this conversation. Number one, on this journey, we all want things to go straight up, 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 like the way a plane takes off. But life is more like a heart rate monitor. Ups, and downs, and ups, and downs. And when you're in a dip moment in your life, that's when it's most essential for you to believe in yourself. Because when you're on the up, it, you know, it takes no courage, no courage at all to believe in yourself because things are rocking. But when you're in a dip, that's when you have the chance to reflect, to learn, and to show yourself what you're really made of. Number two, pain is inevitable, but the suffering is optional. And so while we all will experience pain in our life, choosing not to suffer is a choice you get to make. Going back to the life moments or those wounds that tell you you're not enough and then doing the healing around them to help put to rest the suffering and help you embrace that you are worthy, that you are enough. It's something that we all have the chance to do. And number three, in order to live a satisfying and successful life, there must be 
dips and ebbs and flows. And as Tracy says, I love this, massive glorious fall on your face failures. And more than that, moments that you can look back on and you can't even believe how you acted so embarrassed at the younger, less experienced version of you. You need to recognize that self-forgiveness is central to this entire process. Now, if you are ready to embrace your limitless potential, if you're ready to embrace the fact that you are enough, like Tracy and I spoke about, you're gonna need to face the hard things, big and small in your life. It's not easy, but remember you, me, we, we're not just dreamers, we're doers, because we do hard things. Why did a primary school teacher who built a multi seven figure business walk away from everything to pursue a true passion? Yeah, you wanna know, right? Click on the video right over there to hear this real inspiring story.